Within hours of the earthquake hitting Nepal, a Hercules C-130 and a huge C-17 Globemaster were taking off from the Indian Air Force's Hindon Air Base near Delhi. At the same time, from the Bhatinda Air Base in Punjab, an Illusion 76 Gajraj took off. All headed in the same direction, Nepal. On board were emergency supplies and disaster assessment specialists rushing to Kathmandu in aid of India's neighbor. Welcome back here with the headlines today. The breaking news story that we are playing uh, as of now is the 7.5 earthquake that jolted uh, New Delhi and parts of North India and Northeast India and as well as Nepal. The hours began to drag on that fateful day when a dazed Himalayan nation began to look around, trying to come to terms with what had just happened. But with every passing moment, news of terrible tragedy began expanding its distressing contours. And across seas and oceans, amongst people of different origins and political beliefs, in the furthest corners of the globe, Nepal's crisis began evoking empathy. Workers from around the world are making their way to Nepal right now. Several states Saying across the crisis, India the Korean government relief. dispatched a search and... Governments and international aid organizations started gearing up to help Nepal. Indian aid began flowing within hours, but soon other countries were joining in. First a trickle, then as a constant stream. Aid teams and humanitarian assistance started making its way from all over the world, flowing towards the shaken capital of Nepal. Kathmandu, a city of 700,000 and Nepal's largest municipal area, was reeling under shock. Iconic buildings had collapsed and major damage had wreaked havoc in different parts of the city. But even as the aftershocks continued to haunt the residents of Kathmandu, huge Indian Air Force planes began their risky approach to land at the single runway of Tribhuvan International Airport. Landing on the evening of 26th April 2015, the same day that the 7.9 scale earthquake hit Nepal, these three planes from India heralded the arrival of international help in Nepal's moment of need. We're on board the Indigo airline flight. There are several rescue people on board, several Indian and international journalists. All right, one clear to go. Stock, uh, 38, out. By early 27th, with the airport back to functioning, authorities had to cope not only with the expected exodus, but with an ever-increasing incoming traffic. As foreign tourists began fleeing the disaster zone, foreign aid and aid workers began arriving by the plane loads. India being the closest and having easiest access was the first to mobilize aid, not just taking the aerial route but over land as well. The Indian government sent in buses crossing over from Bihar and Uttar Pradesh. They carried supplies and brought Indian tourists back from across the border in Nepal. We are broadcasting from the Tribhuvan International Airport. A total of six Indian Air Force helicopters, the Mi-17 and a separate variant have been flown in from Gorakhpur in India into Kathmandu, Nepal. The work of removing debris and trying to save as many people as possible... News reporters from India were also already on the field reporting on the extent of damage that the Himalayan country had suffered. The initial reports of earthquake damage was limited to Kathmandu. But before international media arrived on the scene, visuals broadcast on local TV channels like Kantipur TV began telling the world of what was happening in Nepal. Like most of the traumatized city, in those initial hours and days, this channel itself 
was functioning from under makeshift shelters. The stories that Nepalese and Indian TV stations flashed had begun tugging at the conscience of the world. On TV screens across the globe, people watched an impoverished nation trying to make sense of what hit Nepal. Four days after the earthquake struck, realization seeped in that this was one of the worst natural calamity to have hit Nepal in over 80 years. The death toll kept mounting as relief and rescue operations spread outwards from Kathmandu. As days went by, it was the stench of death and not the cry of hope that began to direct relief operations. Dogs from India, China and Europe sniffed at the rubble of destruction as their handlers directed relief teams to where the dogs barked their special bark. Trained in far off lands, these dogs sometimes became the only means to quickly assess the possibility of bodies being there under a pile of shattered bricks and concrete. जो हमारे डॉग का ट्रेंड वो है इसका ट्रेड है वो सर्च एंड रेस्क्यू है वहां पर उन, उनको सूंघने के लिए बोलते हैं ये हमें सूंघ करके वहां डिगिंग करेंगे या बार करके बताएंगे कि यहां आदमी है तो इससे हम समझ जाते हैं कि यहां आदमी हो सकता है द फायर्स एट पशुपतिनाथ इन काठमांडू बर्नड कंटीन्यूअसली कंसाइनिंग टू द फ्लेम्स द रिमेंस ऑफ दोस हु हैड पेरिशड फ्रेंड्स एंड फैमिली मोंड दोस हु वर नोन but then there were those countless others who burned away in the ignominy of not ever being identified. These were numbers that added to the deathly statistics. This was the moment when a nation's helplessness stood revealed in the face of natural disaster. Disaster that struck Nepal at 11.56 a.m. local time on 26th of April 2015 when a relatively minor convulsion deep below the Earth's surface resulted in massive damage over ground. Landmass stretching across five countries and thousands of square kilometers trembled. Fifteen kilometers below ground, the tectonic plate of India, in its relentless push northwards, slid a few extra inches under the larger Eurasian one. A crust of land on the surface, measuring 120 kilometers by 75 kilometers, shifted southwards. Kathmandu, the capital of Nepal, in a mere 30 seconds, moved 10 feet to the south. And in the high Himalayas, tremulous ridges set off massive avalanches. More than 200 kilometers east and slightly to the north of the epicenter, mountaineers from across the globe had been going about their business of assaulting Mount Everest. When they felt Chomolungma rise from its slumber. At the Everest base camp, tents and human lives lay in the path of a massive avalanche. There was nothing that anybody could do. Oh, oh. On the top of the world, trained and seasoned mountaineers stood and helplessly watched as white death approached.
An Indian Army mountaineering team recovered 19 dead bodies from the south base camp on Everest and evacuated tens of others. But with estimates of there having been more than 700 mountaineers of some 50 nationalities spread out across the five camping stages of Everest, the fatal figures may still rise. For close to two days after the earthquake struck, there was no scope for damage assessment out in the countryside. Nepal was not equipped to manage a natural calamity of this extent. Indian Army choppers carried out the first aerial survey of Lamjung, the small town closest to the epicenter of the quake. Soon, other countries pitched in with their personnel and specialists. Within days, 45 countries had pledged manpower, equipment and funds for the beleaguered nation. Countries from Europe, Asia, the Americas, Australia and all of Nepal's neighbours pitched in. With hundreds of people on the ground, millions of dollars in aid and tons of equipment being flown in, Nepal dominated international news for the better part of the week. And then the problems of coordination began to mount. Nepal began finding it increasingly difficult to cope with the influx of international aid. Tribhuvan International Airport, Nepal's sole air link to the world, became choked with eight flights coming into land. Some flights had to circle for some time before getting permission to land. Others had to be diverted to airports in India. Even flights that did land had trouble in offloading and storage of aid material. Once aid material had been offloaded, the challenge was in its distribution. Roads remained cut off and only India that brought in Mi-17 and Throv and Cheetah helicopters along with the Nepal army could reach towns and villages devastated by the massive quake. Roads and communication which outside Kathmandu at the best of times are rudimentary were totally cut off because of the earthquake. 65 aftershocks that first day and another big jolt on 27th had panic spreading across Nepal. In Kathmandu people stayed out of doors for days fearful of the state of their houses. International teams, governmental and NGOs brought in specialists to assess the state of the buildings. How, what's your assessment of the kind of damage that's been done here? Our assessment is uh, 70 to 80 percent of houses are damaged in this area. Now there's several people who are standing around wondering whether it's safe for them to go back into their houses. As an expert, what do you think? I'm not an expert in construction, so it is very hard to make a judgment. There could be another earthquake, any buildings that are damaged might fall down. So my judgment at the moment is until a structural engineer someone with an expert in building construction has seen the building, then no. From time to time, hope flickered in Nepal as miraculous rescues were carried out. A woman pulled out after 48 hours. A man brought out 64 hours after he was buried under rubble. And a four-month-old child emerging alive more than 80 hours after the earthquake had brought a building down on it. And of course, the teenager who was found a full 120 hours after the quake. A massive international effort is on to reach humanitarian aid to Nepal. Volunteers and aid workers from countries near and far 
are working shoulder to shoulder with the Nepalese. Digging, rescuing and rehabilitating towns and villages perched on mountainsides. At stake are hundreds and thousands of lives that had changed for the worse when the earth shook beneath their feet. The world has come to help a young nation in its time of tragedy. But Nepal will still take years to rebuild what the earthquake brought down in a matter of seconds. For thousands from Nepal and elsewhere who lost a loved one, the scars may well heal, but the scabs will probably remain forever.